ocean. What comes to your mind when you hear the word ocean? Do you think of it as where your seafood comes from? Is it where nature's animals are lurking? Is it the source of your livelihood? Or is it simply a big patch of uh, seawater and a bit of wave action? For me, it is home. Because 71% of the Earth's surface is actually covered by oceans. Ocean produces the air that we breathe, the food, seafood that we are eating, and also medicines that keep us alive and healthy. It is also the home that we share with so many other amazing species of marine animals, many that are threatened and many still yet to be discovered. So, let me share with you how I come to this perspective. While growing up in Sabah, I was more and more familiar with the terrestrial wildlife that we have. The orangutans, proboscis monkeys, bonyong pygmy elephants, and sun bears. But all these perspectives changed when I had the opportunity to, to participate in a marine education program in Lankayan Island. Well, for the first time, I went snorkeling. I remember looking through my snorkel and looking through my mask and reading through the snorkel and felt like a visitor to this magical world. I'm completely mesmerized by its beauty and the diversity of marine species that live underwater. And then my interest in marine life grew and I went on to pursue my degree in marine science and later on I had the opportunity to volunteer for a dolphin research program in Langkawi. Well, if you have always wondered how it's like to be in a dolphin research program, this is pretty much what we see whole day, staring at the sea for hours and hours, trying to look for any signs of marine mammals uh, breaking the surface. Some days we are drenched in the heavy rain, some days we are sunburned by the rays of the sun, and also some days when the sea is so choppy that we are wondering what we have got ourselves in. Whenever there is a sighting, that's where our heartbeat goes from almost flat to a big height. We had the privilege to observe these marine mammals in the wild, whether they are frolicking in the sea, leaping out of the water, or simply catching a breath. And sometimes we can smell that fishy breath in the air. And it's always a privilege and joy to observe them study their distribution, abundance, behavior, social structure, and etc. But Baba Dayan once said that in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. So, we are from an NGO called Marasep. Our focus is on marine mammal research and conservation in Malaysia. And currently, we have three project sites in Malaysia. The Langkawi Dolphin Research for the Langkawi Perlis and Kedah Waters, Matang Dolphin Research in Perak, and also a Dugong Research Project in Johor. Our activities include boat-based surveys, interview surveys with fishermen, workshops with veterinary students, scuba diving for seagrass surveys, group events, exhibitions, School programs with kids to educate, uh, to educate them about marine education, meeting with government agencies, and also beach cleanups. Now in Malaysia, there are at least 27 species of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and dugongs in our Malaysian waters. And if you have been wondering where can we see these marine mammals, they are pretty much throughout our coastal waters. And the dugongs, because they are herbivores and they rely on seagrass, they are found in Johor, Sabah, and Sarawak. Now these are some of the more commonly seen species in our waters. The Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins, they are born grey, and as they mature, they have more pink pigmentation. The cute Irrawaddy dolphins, they have a rounded head and more shy. The elusive uh, Indo-Pacific Venus porpoise, they don't have a dorsal fin on top of their body. Bottlenose dolphins are highly surface active animals and they have a very high arcade uh, dorsal fins. Dugongs, and one of the mo more commonly seen whale species in Malaysia is Brutus whale. They can grow up to 15 meters. Now we have seen 
the beautiful side of the ocean, but we have also seen the ugly side of it. We have seen dolphins swimming in polluted waters, full of marine debris. Animals in poor body conditions, emaciated, lack of food. Animals that have marine debris tangled on their body, and this individual is called fan belt, with a thick rubber on its body. Animals that are in contact with human activities, such as entanglement in fishing gears or boat propeller strikes, this is called flop. And we have also seen how much we are taking from our ocean, from our trawling activities. As you can see, we are taking so much and so much more than what we should have been taking. And some of these catch are not actually being consumed by humans because some of these fishes are small, small fishes that are non-targeted. These are called trash fish that are sold for a very cheap price to be processed as aquaculture food for the cultured fish. There are baskets and baskets of them every day. And there are also ghost nets. Ghost nets are nets that are lost or left by fishermen in the sea. And these nets keep on entangling animals every day as well, as long as they are in the water column. And if you ever go to a relatively remote beach, this is the site that you might see, a beach full of all sorts of marine debris, plastics and all. While we can always do beach cleanup to clean up these places, that is not a permanent solution. Because the root of this problem is our disposable culture, out of sight, out of mind. When we no longer need something, we can just simply throw it away. But Annie Leonard once said, there is no such thing as a way. When you throw something away, it must go somewhere. After all, we only have one planet Earth to live in. Does it end up in the landfills? Does it end up in our rivers, our oceans? Or does it end up in the stomachs of some poor animals? Now there was a study by a group of scientists that looked at mismanaged plastic waste from land to sea. Because you might imagine, I'm just being on the land, whatever I do might not affect the sea. But actually, out of 192 coastal countries, Malaysia is number 8 on the list, with 0.94 million metric tons of mismanaged plastic waste from land to sea every year. And it, I was a little bit disturbed when I learned about the rate of decomposition of common marine debris. If we simply throw a plastic bag into the ocean, it takes 10 to 20 years to decompose. A styrofoam cup takes 50 years. Aluminium can takes 200 years, while a disposable diaper and a plastic bottle takes 450 years. And some of these plastics actually never goes away because they will only break to smaller and smaller pieces of plastics called microplastics. They will eventually be eaten by plankton, which will be eaten by little fish, larger fish, and in the end, it ends up on our seafood. Well, unsurprisingly, some of this marine debris ends up in the stomach of some animals. In this case here, this is a pilot whale in Kudat Sabah where when it was found, it has 4.25 kilograms of plastics in its stomach. This includes plastic sheets, plastic bags, nylon ropes, and also a detergent container. Or you may wonder, I'm just a single person. What can I do for a marine environment? This problem seems to be too huge to be solved by me one person alone. But let me assure you that whatever you choose to do or choose not to do matters a lot. First of all, you can be more mindful. You can be more conscious about the decisions that you take every day. Whether it's the seafood that you are eating, how is it caught, or about your plastic consumption, things that you throw away on a daily basis. And if you have always been more familiar with the concept of three R's, 
I challenge you to expand it to six hours today. Rethink. Rethinking about our consumption, our choices in our daily lives, and what are the effects of it. Refuse. Refusing things that you don't actually need in your life. And reducing things and reducing things that you need or your purchases. Reusing is to reuse things that you have for other purposes. Repair things that are broken instead of throwing them away directly. And recycling should only be your last resort when the other options are not viable. Because recycling is not a permanent solution as well. Like some of the plastics that you might think you can recycle, but actually there's a limit of how many times it can be recycled. And in our everyday lives, there's so much single-use plastics. Whether it's a plastic bottle, a food container, plastic utensils, a cup, plastic cup, and plastic straws. You can eliminate them by bringing your own containers, your own cups, your own bottles, and refusing straws. You can directly drink straight from the cup. Next is to volunteer. Volunteering is perhaps one of the best decisions I've made. It gives me the chance to experience new things. And, volunt and help is always needed in all the marine organizations, whether you want to be involved in protecting the seahorses, sea turtles, coral reefs, sharks, or marine mammals. And it's not always help in just field, you can also help in other capacity, whether it's designing educational materials or doing data entry for all these organizations. Last but not least, it is to innovate. Now that you have learned that there are so much issues in our marine environment, there are solutions that we need. With your creative minds and perhaps your engineering skills, you can contribute to reduce the bycatch problem that we have or simply uh, creating materials as alternatives to plastics so that there are less trash in our environment. With that, I hope you have learned a little bit more about our marine environment and I urge you to go out and explore the beautiful sea that we have and protect them.